Please welcome Mr. Masaki Morisawa, the Senior Product Manager from Gala Turkish Learning, with his paper entitled, The Teacher Doesn't Know the Answer, Learning to Think Through Multiple and Opposing Viewpoints. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very, very happy to be in Kuching today. This is my very first visit to this place, part of this world. I've never been to Borneo before, and I was really, really excited to see this gorgeous library building. I work in the library industry, and I've seen many library buildings, but this must be one of the really most gorgeous and top library buildings. happy to talk about a session titled, The Teacher Doesn't Know the, the Answer. How many of you are teachers in this room, by the way? Oh, okay. So, I'm, this title is not meant to offend you, by the way. Okay. So, it's not about, you know, belittling you or uh, abilities, but I just want to talk a little bit about what we call 21st century education and how we're trying to use uh, open-ended topics that don't have a clear answer to incite students into thinking more rather than just going after exams and looking for a definite answer for things. But before that, let me allow, allow me to uh, briefly introduce my company. You may be familiar with Cengage. Uh, we are an educational publisher and we have several different divisions. You may have known us at, in the context of our textbook divisions. We publish higher education textbooks. We also have a division called National Geographic Learning, which publishes English language textbooks. But today I'll be talking about my division, which is also known under the brand name Gale. Gale is a library imprint of Cengage Learning, and we publish for institutions and libraries like universities, schools, and we are a re very well known in the library business. We have been around for 50 years. And we publish a lot of things like your reference works that often sit in the library reference section. But increasingly, we are going electronic. So we publish ebooks, databases. And today I'll be talking a little bit about some of those things. A little bit about myself. I'm Masaki Morisawa. As you can tell from my name, I'm from Japan. I came from Tokyo, and I support product for the Asia market. If you're wondering about my accent, no, this is not the typical Japanese accent. I lived in the United States as a child, so just to get that out of the way, studied English literature, I'm married, and I have a daughter and a son. So, so much about myself. But uh, being a parent of these uh, wild little things, I'm also concerned about you know, the future of education, not just because I'm in the education industry. I'm also concerned about how are these kids going to grow up? What kind of world are they going to live in in the future? And increasingly, a lot of educators in the world are tackling the same problem. And they came up with this kind of slogan that they call 21st century learning. So 21st century learning or 21st century skills. And that term has many different definitions, but one of them, uh, this one from the OECD Education Directorate, seems, very, seems to sum it up very well. We live in a fast changing world and producing more of the same knowledge and skills will not suffice to address the challenges of the future. So I emphasize some of the passes, some of the passages and words here and the whole emphasis is on change. The world is really, really changing rapidly. And previously, in the old days, maybe you could say, learn how to repair a television set and make your living all, all the while by repairing television sets all your life. That was possible maybe during my dad's generation or my grandfather's generation, if they had TV sets back then. But today, when my children grow up, they might not be such a thing as a TV set in, the li in their living room. They might be you know, wearing special glasses to watch a show, or they might just see it appear in the air or something. How do you prepare your kids to enter into a world like that? It can't be just by instilling them hard skills and unchanging knowledge, because you're pretty sure that's going to change. 
So the whole emphasis in the 21st century skills uh, platform is the emphasis on change. And sometimes change creates controversy. Has any of you seen this image before? This is not the latest Abercrombie & Fitch ad. It's actually a spoof of it. If you look carefully into the background, it says, instead of Abercrombie & Fitch, it says, attractive and fat. So this lady made a spoof of the Abercrombie & Fitch brand. Why did she do that? Because the founding, the founding person of Abercrombie & Fitch, who is a guy called Mike Jeffries, said something in an interview that alarmed a lot of people. He said, well, candidly, at Abercrombie & Fitch, we go after the cool kids. We go after the attractive, all-American kid with a great attitude and a lot of friends. A lot of people don't belong in our clothes, and they can't belong. Are we exclusionary? Absolutely. So basically he's saying, well, Abercrombie is only dealing with the kids with good looks and good, good styles. And he's not really dealing with the, maybe the obese kids or the kids who are not popular in classes and things like that. And that created this kind of controversy. So what is this whole thing about the fashion industry? Why do they have these really, really good looking and slim fashion models wearing these real cool clothes? Is that kind of giving the wrong image to these students and the whole different idea about what to aspire to in the future? So that's a controversy. That's an example of a controversy. So how does this do, what does this have to do with education? Well, increasingly, in the 21st century learning framework, we are encouraged to use controversial social topics like these into the classroom. Why? There are several good reasons, and this is a very good site, procon.org, that gives you some um, compelling arguments. Controversial issue assignments increase critical thinking skills. So these issues, like body image, have no fixed answers. Everyone has a different opinion. Everyone has a different place they're coming from. And it's a real good opportunity to have an open-ended discussion or an argument. And just like I said in the title of this presentation, even the teacher can't say, I have the answer, because there is no definite answer. And that really, really inspires the children and students to think on their own. 93% of higher education faculty believe critical thinking is an essential learning outcome. It's just, you know, really, really becoming the trend in the education industry. But it's not just the educators. Employers, too, who are employing these students after they graduate, they are saying that demonstrated critical thinking is much more important than their under undergraduate majors. And studying and debating controversial topics in schools help increase student attention, motivation, achievement, creativity, and self-esteem. Young people want nothing more than to be heard and understood. They want their views to be listened to. They want their opinions to be heard and evaluated by uh, adults and other people. So it really helps when you have a controversial issue in the classroom and have an open debate or a discussion about them when they can stand up and express their own views instead of just answering a math question. It really helps their self-esteem and they really feel uh, emboldened and empowered in the process. And that really, really motivates them to become adults. So students who debate controversial issues in schools are more likely to be engaged and active citizens when they get out of school and go into the real world. Because this is the real world. The real world is full of controversies. So all of that is really great, but how do you actually implement it? So this, uh, another education specialist says, I put critical thinking up there as one of the most important skills we should be teaching but you can't think critically without something to think about. So how do you get the materials, the appropriate kind of materials that you can provide to students
to do something like that in the classroom. One way is to just invite the students and ask them to do a search on the internet. And that's possible. You can do a search, say, you can say, you can show them the Abercrombie ad on a class and say, next class we're going to discuss this body image thing. So go to the internet and do searches and find material related to this topic. And they can do that. And they can do, you know, a search on Abercrombie and Fitch, and they would come up with a Wikipedia article on that company. But the problem is, sometimes these resources can be a bit tricky. Because, for example, the Abercrombie and Fitch entry in Wikipedia says, a major contributor to this article appears to have a close connection with its subject. So that means maybe someone, an employee of this company, is writing this Wikipedia article and making it look really pretty to the audience, you know. So you never know whether you can really trust these resources. So, at Gale, we are really, really thinking about 21st century skills and how to nurture them for our future generation. And we came up with a whole suite of online products, which we call the in context line of products. And these products tackle controversy head on. You can find many, many different controversial topics like cloning, terrorism, child abuse, gun control, censorship, problems with no correct yes or no answers. There are many shades of arguments in between, a lot of different positions. But we all package them in a really controlled and easy to understand environment. So this is the flagship product called Opposing Viewpoints and Context. If you look at the numbers, you would see that we have an overwhelming amount of material. We have more than 14,000 viewpoint essays, 5,000 topic overviews, more than 300 primary source documents, and so and so forth. But it's not just the amount of material that is in this database that is really compelling. It's the way we build it. And I would like to show you how we build these in-context products. The first thing you would notice when you log into the, one of these products is it doesn't look like a conventional database. It's not you know, just a search box blinking in the middle of a screen. You already see samples of topics and some images and videos from the top page. And it really looks like your regular website just like a Yahoo page or a Google home page. So the student, for the student, this is something really familiar. They can start clicking right away without even having to think of a search term or anything. And it doesn't overwhelm the student with too much content either. And once you go into a topic, these databases are constructed out around a concept we call the topic overview page. So for example, this is a history product called with World History in Context. And the history product would have a whole topic page on the French Revolution. And this topic page is edited by an editor. So the editor would decide which image to put here, what kind of overviews to put here, which essays should be highlighted, and so and so forth. And it's continually updated, so it doesn't stay static. It's really changing over the day. Excuse me. I need to postpone you, sorry. Okay. And when you go into Opposing Viewpoints, it's the same thing. This is the Opposing Viewpoints homepage. So you can see attractive images, topic links, videos, and images. And when you go into one of the topics, and this is the topic page on body image. So that's the Abercrombie and Fitch topic that I discussed in the beginning. You would have a whole lot of material related to the controversial issue of body image. But if you look at it closely, it doesn't overwhelm you because we are selective in our presentation. We give you a topic overview, but we only show you the first paragraph of that. And you have to click on view more to see the entire uh, essay. You can see feature viewpoints that are editors selected, which are great entry points into understanding the issue. And we always organize content into buckets by content type. So there will be the viewpoints, which are the real raw arguments by real people on these real controversial issues. We have reference buckets, which are 
essays that can be taken from our encyclopedias and reference works that give you a more neutral overview of these topics. You have news, magazines, academic journals, primary sources, statistics, all in different categories. So the student understands insti instinctively, just by navigating this website, that magazines, news, and encyclopedia articles are different types of materials, and they have to be read with a different point, point of view. And we expose these content excuse me, content selectively in buckets. So we only show them the first three, top three essays on any given page, but they can always click on view all to see an entire list. And when you open one of the viewpoints article, it's also edited to so for example, this is a real viewpoint written by a real person that says the images of beauty are unrealistic and hurt women. But before you actually read that viewpoint, our editor has added an introductory paragraph explaining the background of this essay and who this person is, where, where is she coming from, he or she is coming from. And he also adds questions to consider while you are reading this whole essay. So it encourages students to think while they are reading. Then you can see another viewpoint articles from the other spectrum of the controversy who is saying that standards of beauty are determined by evolutionary biology. So this person is saying that there are certain standards of beauty that are predetermined by our evolutionary uh, structure or whatever. And when you're reading any essay, you have all these tools in hand too. So you can print these essays, you can email them, download them, share them in Facebook, or even listen to them in, in audio because we have a text-to-speech program embedded in the database. Similarly, you can see a reference article. So the viewpoint articles are kind of extreme examples. They are real, real life arguments, whereas the reference articles will give you a more neutral background and a more balanced overview of the whole body image controversy. Or you can see statistics, or even the latest news article. Like this is a very recent article from October uh, where a beauty queen from Iceland defies a beauty pageant in Las Vegas and she says, I'm going to quit because the officials at the beauty pageant said, well, you better lose some weight if you want to win this contest. And she was really, really angry about those remarks and said, this is not the kind of thing that I want to be involved in. So that's another controversy and a great entry point into a topic. You have multimedia too, like images and videos, and these are all licensed for educational use, so you can use them in your classroom to further attract your students. And while the students are reading the text, they can make highlights and notes to the text. And the great thing is, after you make all the highlights and notes, and say you've identified an interesting passage that you want to quote in your argument, or you want to use in a debate, you can save them all in the cloud because this is seamlessly integrated with Google Drive and Microsoft OneDrive. So if your students have a Gmail address or if they have a, a Microsoft account, they could just instantly upload this stuff into their Gmail, into their Google Drive. And if they're working in a group, they can share that Google Drive folder among their friends and do a little collaboration. Or if your institution has G Suite for Education or Google Classroom, the teacher can instantly make this, make any of these materials into an assignment by just by clicking on a button and set an expiry date or a due date and send it to all of the students. It's also mobile compatible as well. So that was the opposing viewpoints product. And another important skill that's really emphasized today is global awareness. This is an interesting article that was recently uh, announced in BBC News where they have the PISA test that you know evaluate the educational strengths of rel relatively of different nations and they are going to include global skills in their next set of tests. So, even in PISA, it's really becoming a very important skill identified 
global competence and global awareness. So we also have a product for that, which is a sister product of opposing viewpoints and called Global Issues in Context. So this looks at the same kind of controversial issues, but more from an international and global point of view. So for the same idea of body image, you can look at a page entitled International Concepts of Beauty. So this will tackle issues like the Korean obsession with plastic surgery, for example. And these products are sister products. So if, you, if your institution has both of them, you can actually cross-search both of them from the same interfo interface from any of, uh, either of the home pages of these products. <coughs> Speaking of global awareness, there is also this very famous brand called National Geographic. And they were established in 1888. And they have been an advocate of global awareness and global issues even before, long before that kind of argument was fashionable. And we are very, very proud that we have this partnership with the National Geographic Institute where we have digitized the entire back file of the National Geographic magazine from the very first issue in 1888 all the way down to the present, only two months behind the actual publication, as well as a lot of books, pictures, videos from that institute. And if you add this to your curriculum, you can also dig in even further by looking at different concepts of beauty, body image. So you can say, show this to your students. This is a tribe in Burma. And they have a very different concept of beauty where the long neck is valued as a concept of beauty. Or this tribe in Brazil where they have these discs embedded in their lower lip. And they, the big lower lip is, for them, it's a really important concept of beauty. And by doing so, you can kind of expand that whole argument, not just in your own country or in the West, but you can expand it geographically to include a lot of different cultures from different regions. And as well as expanding the whole idea geographically, there's another direction you can take this argument, and that is expanding the argument chronologically into the past. So in 21st century skills, another thing that is often discussed is historical critical thinking or historical thinking skills. The ability to put yourself in the shoes of someone who has lived many centuries ago or many years ago and try to understand their point of view and how that differs from our point of view today. And a gr great tool for doing that would be one of our historical archives. We, have, we actually have many historical archives, and this is just one example, but my favorite one is the Times Digital Archive. And this is the entire back file of the London Times newspaper from its very beginning in 1785. And the cool thing is you can search for any word on any page for these 225 years worth a back file and come up with something like this. I found this interesting ad. This is from 1924. It's an ad for a kind of a drink, I guess, called Wink Harness. I'm not sure if it exists today. But the tagline is really, really interesting. You can actually see how Wink Harness is benefiting you by the way you rapidly increase in weight. Weigh yourself before taking word harness, and again, after taking it for a few days, then note the extraordinary increase. So what does this tell you? In 1924, people were malnourished, and it was actually people were aspiring to increase their weight rather than losing weight. And they yes. advertise these you know, supplements or whatever to help them do that. So that gives you another different angle. Hey, maybe this new this concept of beauty being really skinny isn't something universal. So that's another angle that you can explore with your students. OK, so just to summarize, 21st century skills are really, really changing the way educators are interacting with children and students today. And soft skills such as critical thinking, global awareness, cultural and historical perspectives are really, really becoming important. 
And the best way to nurture them is through presenting controversial, open-ended topics with multiple viewpoints. And at Gill, we have excellent resources that allow you to do so. So for thematically organized and dynamically updated contemporary topics, we recommend opposing viewpoints in context or global issues in context. If you want to give them graphic imagery on scientific journalism with rich images from the National Geographic magazine, of course, National Geographic Virtual Library is the place to go. And if you also want to add historical context to your arguments, a historical database, especially, especially a historical newspaper, like the Times Digital Archive, would help to expand the whole idea chronologically and explore even more different angles from the past and the present. Okay? So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Fonsakia-Morissan, for an interesting presentation. As a token of our appreciation towards our speaker, we would like to invite Mr. Juan Mazliwan Rosali, the Executive Head of ICT Services, to present our mentor to Mr. Masaki Morisawa. Please welcome. Thank you, Mr. Juan Masli, and thank you, Mr. Masaki Morrison. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now our second...